postcards from the moon, understanding, or exploring and understanding our natural satellite. Uh, many of you follow me on Facebook. That is my current series. For about three years, I did something I call 365 Days of the Moon, where every morning I would post a new picture or a different picture I took of the moon through my telescope and explain a little bit about it. And then during the COVID area, that kind of faded away when I was doing other projects. But I've revived it, and now I call it Postcards from the Moon. And uh, look me up on Facebook, and uh, every morning, every day, we'll get another postcard from the moon explaining something about our natural satellite. So, what are we going to be doing here? So, today we're going to explore the phases of the moon, and I think Angela Speck did a real good job of explaining that a while ago, so we'll breeze through that. Um, the creation of the face of the moon. We'll explain a little bit about the lunar maria, the dark areas of the moon that create the, the caricature of the face of the man of the moon. Uh, we'll explore the mysteries along the terminator, the division between the sunlit and the dark side of the moon. Uh, we'll take a voyage to the four major landmarks that everybody falls in love with on the moon, Plato Crater, Copernicus Crater, Tycho, and Straight Wall. Uh, we'll examine volcanic features on the moon, objects called ghost craters, four fractured craters, the rays that spray out from fairly fresh craters, odd-shaped craters, they're not all round, uh, valleys on the moon, mountains on the moon, cliffs on the moon, so uh, there's lots up here to uh, explore. And they, uh, of course, the ever-changing face of the moon, it's never the same two nights in a row. So first thing we notice, the waxing crescent moon after a full moon, I mean after a new moon, it starts to appear low in the west above the sun. I call it the Cheshire Cat Moon. Remember the tale of Alice in Wonderland where the Cheshire Cat faded away until only a smile was left? That's what it looks like to me. Now, the first large maria that we notice on the moon is of course Mari Chrysium. Kind of looks like this unwinking eye staring back at Earth. Uh, Langrenus Crater and Batavius Craters also appear during the thin crescent moon, and you can see these in binoculars. Uh, you don't need a, a, a high power telescope to see some of these large features. Uh, progressing along about uh, a week after new moon, we now see the quarter moon, where significantly more of the lunar surface is, is visible. Chrysium again, the um, first Mare that appears, and now joined by Fecunditatis, Nectaris, Tranquilitatis, of course, where Apollo 11 landed, and Serenitatis. And along the edge of the moon, the sunrise, sunset area, we call it the terminator, the uh, area along here. This is an area where the shadows reveal the greatest relief in the features. So first quarter moon is a very popular time to point a telescope up there and explore these. The first quarter moon, the moon is uh, pretty high in the sky at sunset, um, unlike phases after full moon where they don't rise until late or early in the morning. So uh, first quarter moon is very popular uh, for uh, novice moon gazers, moon gazers to uh, explore uh, the features on the moon. Uh, progressing further, we get the waxing gibbous moon, gets bigger and bigger. Uh, at this point, Mariembrium joins the crowd, uh, Nubium, Humorum, all of these uh, Latin sounding names. These regions on the moon were named back in the uh, 17th century by uh, an Italian monk, Giovanni Riccioli. And uh, back in the uh, 17th century, a number of lunar maps were created by various people in uh, uh, the Netherlands or in Poland, but they tended to name lunar features after nationalistic features or their local royalty, and that didn't have an international flavor to it, so it didn't stick. The Riccioli scheme of naming the large dark areas after states of the mind or weather, like Mare Imbrium, the Sea of Rains, Nubium, uh, the Sea of Clouds, Humorum, uh, the uh, Sea of Humidity, 
and naming craters after philosophers and scientists. And well, that stuck. So for the past three or 400 years, that's the system we use to name features on the moon. And uh, of course, not all of them are ancient. Mari Cognita, named in 1964. Uh, so uh, and then uh, Mari and Solara, uh, not named until 1976. So there are new names on the moon appearing all the time. Now, we're going to uh, pay closer attention later on to Plato Crater, the dark uh, spot out there. Back in the old days, uh, 17th, 18th centuries, uh, before Plato's name was really established, he used to call it the Greater Black Lake, for obvious reasons. We'll see when we uh, look a little closer. Copernicus Crater, one of the younger craters on the face of the moon because of the, the massive ray system. Tycho, uh, even younger still. Uh, Tycho, we believe, is only 108 million years old, which sounds like forever, but consider the moon is 4.6 billion years old. So Tycho Crater is fairly new. In fact, uh, Tycho Crater was created during the era of the dinosaurs. And there is some speculation with uh, a little bit of thought behind it that the asteroid family, <coughs> asteroid family that uh, the member that impacted the moon and created um, Tycho and impacted the area of the Gulf of Mexico to create the Chicxulub Crater that is reputed to be the dinosaur killer, you know, the one that wiped out uh, many species of life on Earth back in prehistoric times, were part of the same family of asteroids. So there's a direct link between Tycho and the complete change in the evolution of life on Earth. You know, if uh, the dinosaurs hadn't been wiped out, we wouldn't be here. Otherwise, we'd be dinosaur food. <laughs> <laughs> Now, yeah, getting up to the full moon, we see this rising above the eastern horizon. Looks very romantic. You see the character of the face of the man of the moon, the two eyes, the, the nose, the mouth. Uh, the dark lunar Maria, or we create this. Now, the, uh, the Maria came into being, um, well, let me back up a little bit. Uh, you notice the Maria are usually circular, round. Embry up there, very round, Serenitatis round. Uh, all of these follow uh, the theme of being round. These are massive impact craters on the moon, giant craters. Any crater on the moon larger than 300 kilometers in diameter is classified as a basin. These huge shallow basins are low-lying, below mean lunar elevation. So these were all created about 3.8 to 3.9 billion years ago during the Nectarian epoch. And uh, once these massive shallow basins were uh, created, uh, there was a period of volcanism on the moon. It lasted about a billion years, up until about 3 billion years ago. And the low lag areas slowly filled in with lava flows and created the dark maria that we see, the vast basalt fields. Now, should be pushing the button here. <laughs> uh, now they're saying there's two forces that create the face of the man on the moon. The asteroid impacts, uh, we call them endogenic forces, things from outside the moon, uh, I mean exogenic forces, and then subsequent volcanic modification of these impact features by endogenic forces. The volcanism coming up from inside the moon and flooding these asteroid impacts. Now, uh, I've already mentioned this, because I forgot to push the buttons. And then the uh, Mario were formed by eruptions that flooded these basins between 3 and 3.8 million years ago. So the face of the moon, as it creates the caricature of the man of the moon, has been in existence for perhaps about 3 billion years. But uh, what has not been in existence over that period of time or all of the craters that you see that have the ray structure on them, the splatter. These rays fade after about a billion years. So if we see a crater on the moon that has a ray system, it is a fairly young one. And um, say the basins on the moon and the barrio lying within them are not the same thing. They're two different features. The basin is a depression. 
the baria is the basalt that fills the depression. So looking at some of these maria, uh, Chrysium, the first one we see during the Cheshire Cat Moon, um, it fills its brim completely with basalt all the way around to the uh, mountainous rim. Uh, the Pyrenees Mountains form the eastern edge. The uh, western edge is not quite so well defined. Um, there's a number of features within the Mare Plain itself. You see these wrinkle ridges. This is where sheets of basalt buckle toward the center of the basin. As, the, as the, the lava flow filled the basin, it has weight. It had crushed the center of the basin down. The basalt slumped toward the middle, uh, creating these wrinkle ridges. In this case, uh, the wrinkle ridges, they're called by a scientific name of dorsa, or dorsum in plural, and they're named after earth scientists. In this place, in this case, uh, dorsa Tatyaev, dorsa harker, and then on the opposite side, we see the faint outline of dorsa opal, which I misspelled, I'm sorry, it's a double P, e, and uh, dorsa termier. This is, like I said, a lot of sheets of lava slumping toward, or basalt slumping toward the center of the basin. And of course, three craters dot the western shore, Swift, Pierce, and Picard. So uh, you notice there's a contrast between the fairly smooth, uh, unmarked basalt fields of the, uh, of the Maria surrounded by massive amounts of impacts in the surrounding highland territory. So this means that in the past three billion years since these barriers were formed, the impact rate on the moon has declined significantly. And that, again, is very important because we wouldn't be here if that impact rate had slowed down. Prior to uh, back when the basins were formed, the impact rate was perhaps 300 times higher than it is now. But the asteroids that populated the inner solar system back then, well, basically uh, the universe ran out of ammunition. We swept it all up and uh, created the craters, created the basins and so forth. But uh, so the impact rate has slowed down tremendously. So the Amaria, paved over by these basalt fields are fairly smooth and benign compared to the earlier highland areas that were just blasted repeatedly by massive impacts. And of course, if that impact rate had not slowed down to its moderate level, again, we would not be here contemplating this because the massive extinction level events would occur over and over again and life could not take root to evolve to the point where we're standing here pondering this stuff. So, moving on to other ones. Here we've got uh, Bari Nectaris. Uh, follows the same thing. Uh, circular impact basin, filled with basin, uh, with, with basalt. Uh, except in this case, we've got the, these nice little craters decorating around the, uh, the rim of it. Theophilus, Cyrilus, Katharina, and Fracastorius down the bottom, making that horseshoe bay. Landed on the rim of the basin, so lava flows flooded into Fracastorius as they filled up uh, the Nectarian Basin and created this horseshoe bay. Uh, Mari Embryo uh, makes the uh, man of the moon's left eye when we look at the full moon. Uh, visually, it looks like the largest Mari as seen from the Earth, but it's actually the second largest. I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, except it forms the man of the moon's left eye. Is that our left or? Uh, his left as we're looking at him, which would be our right, because okay. we're turned around. Uh, anyway, uh, Plato crater up the top. Uh, strange little snake-eyed crater, Cassini, had the double impact in it after it was formed. Uh, Aristarchus crater. Another Plato wannabe. Notice the uh, interior of Aristarchus is completely paved over with basalt. Uh, this is common to craters near the Maria. The uh, same uh, magma chambers, subterranean magma chambers that flooded the basins also welled up lava through the fractures in the bottom of the craters and flooded them from the inside. 
This is not lava that topped the crater and flowed into it. This is lava that flowed up from underneath and filled the crater from below. Uh, the uh, Mari Humor, uh, one of my favorites simply because oatmeal cookie looking Gassendi crater up there. Very distinctive looking crater. You don't see this one until uh, well into the waxing gibbous moon. So uh, it, it's, it's not something that pops up early in, as the moon phases go by. But once you see Gassendi, well, you're hooked. This thing is fascinating. It's a, what we call a floor fractured crater. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And we've got Doppelmayr down at the bottom, another semi-horseshoe bay with a very distinctive, almost pyramid-looking central peak. Not all the maria, not all the basins completely filled with basalt to create a solid maria. Uh, this is Maria Austral down on the lower left side of the face of the moon. And uh, it's near the far side of the moon, near the rim of the moon. Uh, the far side crust on the moon <coughs> is thicker than the near side. So there are fewer volcanic eruptions on the far side. There is no massive maria like there are on the near side. But along the rim, or the limb between the near and the far side, the crater, the, the crust was thick enough that it restricted the amount of lava that came up. So instead of fully paving over the uh, Orient uh, uh, Austral Basin, uh, we end up with a collection of lava filled craters. Oops. <laughs> I keep forgetting to push the button. Okay, the explanation I already gave you. Now, we're talking about uh, Imbrium appearing to be the largest Mari on the moon, but it's actually the second largest. Um, Oceanus Procellarum is actually the largest. It's twice the size of Mari Imbrium, but it's along the western limb. So our view of it is highly foreshortened. And uh, because of that foreshortened view, even though it's the largest Mari on the moon, it contributes very little to creating the caricature of the face of the man on the moon. That, that, that huge Mari is so much on the side of the face of the man on the moon that you don't notice it when you look up its, uh, and see the moon's two eyes, his nose, and his mouth. Now, it's the only lunar Mari that is called an ocean. You know, all the others are called uh, uh, Mare, or sea. Uh, this one is Oceanus, or ocean. And uh, I've already said that. Uh, Procellarum is punctuated by a number of fairly fresh, less than a billion year old craters with a substantial ray system. Aristarchus, Copernicus, Kepler. Uh, this cluster of three rayed craters on the dark background of uh, Oceanus Procellarum allows us to see the, this bright spot with our naked eye when we look at the moon without a telescope. You can see the bright area formed by, by these ray patterns. And I've turned this image on its side simply to make it fit in the computer screen. This is actually along the, the western limb of the moon, and we're looking at Mari Oriental, the Oriental Sea. Um, just hugs the lunar limb. The moon, because of its orbit, the elliptical orbit, will slowly rock back and forth just a little bit every month, dip up and down, rock back and forth. So actually, we end up seeing a total of 59% of the surface of the moon, except a lot of it is at a very slant angle, so we, we really can't see the detail too well. But the uh, Mari Oriental will sometimes tip toward us, and we see it like this, sometimes it'll tip away, vanish. So, and in the nearby territories, we've got Burgius Crater, a fairly fresh one because of the rays, uh, a Plato wannabe, Kruger, and Grimaldi, labeled traditionally as a crater. But our understanding of lunar geology today uh, classifies it as a basin. So uh, if we started all over again and renamed all the features on the moon from scratch, as we know them today, uh, this would be Mari Grimaldi, but we still traditionally call it a crater. Now, the terminator, the division between the sunlight 
the dark side of the moon. They can play tricks on us. We have seen the crater at the upper left very recently in some of our pictures. Yeah, but it is almost unrecognizable in this deep, deep shadow. It is Fracastorius at the bottom rim of Mare Nectaris. And the uh, Piclobini crater is also very uh, well known because it uh, is at the end of the Altai Scarp, which we will take a look at a little while later. Uh, two other well-known craters on the moon are uh, almost indistinguishable when you're, they're on the, on the Terminator. Uh, they're the lunar strongmen, both Atlas and Hercules. Strongmen side by side. Oh. side by side on the moon. Hercules crater and Atlas crater. And there's some that uh, are fairly large craters on the moon, but we tend to ignore them. Uh, these particular ones down in the Southern Highlands, uh, in an area that is so cluttered with other craters, we just don't pay attention to them. <laughs> They're just a mass of craters, but um, you see uh, strange names like Petiscus, um, Homel, Mutus, all these uh, names that uh, really don't make a whole lot of sense. I mean, who are these guys? We never hear about them. But uh, they, uh, they're there for a reason. They're all significant um, doctors, philosophers, physicists in their time. Uh, the moon is a who's who in science through the ages. Uh, you, you look at the uh, map of the moon and look up who these people are, and uh, you find that they've made some significant contributions to science that affect our, day, our, our daily lives all the time. And Gutenberg, everybody knows Gutenberg, the inventor of the printing press. But we get down into uh, others, Goclinius, who was that? That's actually Goclel, a uh, German physician back in the 18th century. And then we, uh, Miguel Haynes. Who the heck is that? Well, actually, we're very familiar with this fellow. We just know him by a different name, Ferdinand de Magellan. And the same with um, Christophe Colomb. We celebrate him as Columbus, the discoverer of the Americas. And other craters, well, the Terminator almost vanish in plain sight. This is Jensen Crater, 200 kilometers across. Uh, it's, it's huge, but it's so shallow and so torn up and beaten up through the ages that some people look right at it and don't recognize it. Um, they'll find Fabricius Crater, because it looks more traditional, and it'll look right over Jansen, not even recognizing it. And then, of course, there's Ryman Jansen running through it. Uh, very fascinating grill on the moon. We'll talk a little bit more about those shortly. Yeah, we uh, mentioned these a little while ago, uh, the uh, craters around uh, Mare Nectaris. Although they're similar in age, Theophilus at top looks much younger than Cyrillus and Katharina down below them. But they're all formed probably within 100 million years of each other. So what happened? Well, Katharina formed first. It was an early, well, the earliest of the three. And then Cyrillus formed, and the ejecta and the seismic shock of the formation of Cyrillus ruined Katharina, collapsed it, filled it in with debris. And then along comes Theophilus, formed last, and similarly ruins Cyrillus and Katharina with seismic shock and shower of, of uh, uh, ejecta, and it remains as the freshest looking, even though they're all very similar in age. So I have a question about the formation in the middle of the crater. Yeah, the central of, peak. Kind of looks like a photograph of a water droplet. Exactly, exact it's, same process. So is the crater, <clears throat> the meteoroid liquefying the surface of it from the intense energy of the impact? That and, and the splash. fact that uh, rock on a uh, scale of over kilometers mm -hmm. reacts to the cosmic impact in a fluid fashion. Even though it's solid rock, 
you will bounce because of the forces involved. These, these asteroid impacts are the most powerful non-nuclear explosions in uh, the solar system. Well, I take that back. Well, no, <laughs> that is correct because only an explosion on the sun is more powerful, but that is a nuclear explosion. Uh, so anyway, so the most powerful non-nuclear explosions, uh, these things deform the subsurface rock, compress it, and it bounces back up exactly like that classic drop of milk in the dish where you see it splash back up. And that's exactly how these central peaks form, except it doesn't splash back down or level out again. Now, there's that Plato crater that we were talking about, the Greater Black Lake. It's up here on the northern shore of Mare Imbrium, and just above it, Mare Fragoris, which is one of the wider, I'm talking about Fragoris, it's one of the wider Mare on the moon, but it's also very narrow, only about 200 kilometers high, but it'll span 1,600 kilometers across the top of the moon, above Mare Imbrium and Mare Serenitatis, so it kind of forms the eyebrows above the man in the moon's eyes. But, uh, there's Cassini again. A uh, very distinctive crater because of the, uh, the two double impacts that occurred within its walls. And in the category of not all craters around, look at W Bond up there, a very square crater. Now, yeah, getting closer to uh, Tygo, uh, <laughs> closer to Copernicus. Uh, now we're picking up little details, craters, little craterlets on the floor of Ty um, Plato. Uh, these are considered a, a test of how good your optics are, how good your telescope is, how good, how stable the atmosphere is. So uh, if you see these uh, crater that's in Plato, uh, you're doing pretty good. Your observation session is doing well. Now the Alps Mountains surround Plato, the Alpine Valley, cuts through it, and we'll get a better look at that next. Now there's two little mountains on northern Mare Imbrium that, uh, well, they're kind of sentimental favorites with everybody. I mean, they're just little isolated peaks poking up through the basalt fields, but everybody loves Mount Pico and Mount Python. Don't ask me why, I love them too. But uh, once you see him, uh, it's oh hi, how are you? <laughs> and then there's Thor's hammer. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's a feature that, uh, hey, I named that. That's my name. Features on the moon, on celestial objects that don't have official names by the IAU or official catalog designations. Um, like the Lagoon Nebula, for instance. Uh, everybody's familiar with, with the, the popular name. That name is there only because it sticks. We like it, we use it, we, it's, it's used in familiar terms. Uh, it's not an official catalog designation, but the same with features on the moon. And uh, I tripped over that one day and I said, that looks just like Molnir, Thor's Hammer. So I'm trying to promote that name. <laughs> Yeah, we're descending closer and closer to Plato. Now we see the Alpine Valley and we see this grill running down the middle of it. Uh, that grill is only about um, 500 yards across. So uh, well, when you're getting detail that well with a telescope from Earth, a uh, particular telescope sitting on top of my garage in Terrell Hills, uh, the seeing was pretty good that night. So these mountains on the moon, how do they compare to mountains on the Earth in terms of height? Uh, some of them are pretty high. We've got uh, some peaks in the uh, Apennines that uh, get up to uh, uh, about five kilometers. Um, Everest, of course, not last long, uh, reaches them. But you got to remember, the moon is only one quarter of the diameter of the Earth. So on a statistical comparison, uh, <laughs> they're enormous. Uh, that, that would be like uh, uh, maybe an 80,000 foot high mountain on Earth on, on the same same physical scale. So are 
are those mountains formed like by the same processes as the ones in Earth? They're, 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 they're formed differently, and that will come toward the end of my, difference of my, my presentation, and it will explain the difference between mountains on the moon and mountains on the Earth. There's quite a bit of difference, actually. Now we're getting down to Tycho Crater. Uh, like I said, only 108 million years old. And you notice that uh, you can pick out Tycho simply because it is so fresh and young. It's in a sea of old, degraded craters that have been there for billions of years. Uh, like uh, you know, Tycho and uh, Longa Montanas, uh, filled with debris, very eroded. Uh, <clears throat> Clavius, um, again, filled with debris, smoothed over by other impacts. So uh, the, the topography of the old moon that hosts Tycho is completely different. An ancient, weathered, worn down terrain and fresh Tycho forming on top of all of that. Now getting closer, Notice the almost rusted, sandblasted, pitted appearance. Thousands and thousands of tiny, tiny little craters all around, just overlaying everything. Those are secondary craters created by debris blasted out of the Tycho impact and <coughs> showered out on the rest of the moon. So what goes up must come down unless it exceeded the lunar escape velocity of 2.4 kilometers per second. And if it came back down, it hit somewhere, it made some of these, uh, made these secondary craters. And getting even closer still, um, you can see these secondary craters seem to radiate outward, sometimes even in chains from the central impact. And Copernicus Crater, again, a picture that I turned sideways just to fit it on the screen. But uh, here at Copernicus, we see the massive ray structure spreading out in all directions. And in the upper left toward uh, Eratosthenes Crater, you see this massive fields of secondary craters, again created by material ejected out of Copernicus, rained back down on the ground, and punched their own series of little tiny craters. They're really evident along here at low sun elevation. Uh, shows them up with, um, with the shadows. Oops, uh, okay, well, uh, like I said, this is an experiment. I gotta learn my own program. I keep forgetting what slides next. Uh, placing uh, the location of this, familiar Mari Embryo, the man in the moon's left eye, up on the top, uh, Eratosthenes Crater, um, the Carpathian Mountains, and of course, um, the secondary craters that I've been babbling about, uh, Mari Insularum. Another one of the new uh, uh, Mari named within our own lifetime. Uh, Mari and Solara means the sea of islands. And in this low sun elevation, you see these massive clusters of, of uh, hills and, and mountain peaks. So uh, uh, very well named many islands on the, uh, on the Mari. And then the Rheinhold Crater, almost in deep shadow. Straight wall. Now this is another one of those features that once you find it on the moon, it becomes one of your sentimental favorites. Um, at sunrise, straight wall is, uh, well, it's a scarp, it's a, a cliff, but no, that's misleading. I'm talking from my youth. Um, back when I first started playing with the moon back in the 1950s, uh, it was imagined that straight wall was indeed a sheer cliff. But we understand it now as being just a steep slope, uh, probably about 30 degrees. Um, I would say a very spirited astronaut could probably traverse that on foot in the future, uh, being very careful, of course, because lunar gravity is only one-sixth that of Earth, and uh, you can easily lose your footing just because of the strangeness of it. But it's actually just a, a slope. Uh, the whole thing, the elevation difference is about 300 meters from one side to the other. So, straight wall. Oh, okay. Yeah, where it's casting a shadow. During sunrise, it'll cast a shadow, and sunset, when the sun is fully illuminating it from the face, it changes from a black line feature to a white line feature. 
and let's progress on through our slides here. Uh, placing it, we're on the west eastern shore of Mare Nubium. Uh, our actual crater up above it is a very familiar, famous crater on the moon. Uh, next to it, favorite crater. But uh, the uh, area where Straight Wall lies, look closely, you see it's a horseshoe crater that is partially buried by Nubia lavas. You can see the wrinkle ridges that trace out the rest of this ghost crater or horseshoe bay. So uh, the, this, this is a fairly huge crater. It has no official name. So we just simply call it Ancient Thabit. Another one of these popular names and somebody stuck on it and it, and it works. Now, as I said, at sunset, the straight wall turns into a white line feature because that, that um, slope face is being fully illuminated by the sun. And this, this picture fascinates me. Can you imagine standing on the top slope of straight wall and looking out at sunset across Martin Nubia as the sun slowly sinks down below the horizon? Remember on the moon, the moon rotates uh, once a month as opposed to Earth's rotation of uh, every 24 hours. It takes two minutes for the sun to fully set. When it hits the horizon, it takes two minutes for the disk to sink below the horizon. On the, on the moon, it will take the, the, the sun an hour to set. So you've got plenty of time to contemplate up there on top of straight wall, watching that solar disk go down. Uh, in addition to the uh, bumps and holes in the moon, there's a lot of scratches. Uh, we call them rills. They are channels on the moon uh, created primarily by volcanism. Uh, here we notice the Rima Triesnecker. We call them irregular branching rills. Um, these are created by several different types of forces, all volcanic, but uh, in the case of a uh, Triesnecker, it's like, uh, well, in a drought that we're having now. The riverbed dries up and the mud cracks. Uh, same thing happens when uh, basalt cools and subsides and shrinks and cracks on the moon. Uh, the uh, Rima hygienist is uh, a series of collapsed volcanic vents. You can see dotted throughout the, uh, the reel, there are these volcanic collapse pits. In fact, hygienist crater in the middle of it is nine kilometers in diameter, and it's the largest non-impact crater on the moon. It's a volcanic collapse pit. And then we get over to <clears throat> ah, another feature that I name, uh, the heart of the moon. This is an unnamed pyroclastic region just north of uh, Rima Hyginus, and you notice it's significantly darker than the rest of the moon, or the rest of the region uh, of the moon. That's because it was dusted down with volcanic ash from the volcanic eruptions that created all the, uh, the collapse pits in Rima Hygienus. And then Rima Arideus. Almost looks like a highway cut, like uh, Texna plowed on through to get ready to pave the highway. Uh, this is a feature called a gravid. It's where the land in between two parallel faults collapsed and sunk down. And what causes that is uh, a sheet of magma forced up from the molten core of the moon reaches near the surface but doesn't breach it. If it reaches it, it's a volcanic eruption. It floods everything. But it gets close, it stops, it forces the surface apart, and things collapse. So all of this volcanic activity is really ancient, right? There's yeah, not the, any more it's... Right? The moon has been pretty volcanically dead for about a billion years. Okay. So there was oxygen? No, the moon has never had an atmosphere. Uh, you, you can have volcanic eruptions uh, in, in a vacuum. It's not fire. <laughs> well, well, it doesn't burn like lava burn structures or, 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 or trees or whatever on Earth. Say it, fire. Mm. Excuse me? Oh, <laughs> lava, whatever, it's hot. <laughs> uh, I like this picture. It's kind of like looking out the side window on your spaceship as you're orbiting around the moon, just enjoying the view. But uh, here we've got our familiar Hercules and Atlas, the uh, 
two lunar strongmen, uh, moving out a little closer to the uh, uh, limb of the moon, we see Endymion Crater, another one of these Plato wannabes that's completely paved over with basalt, the uh, central peak and much of the uh, collapsed terrace walls of the crater have been paved over. And along the very limb of the moon, Mari Humboldt Jahn, uh, named after the German explorer uh, Humboldt, who uh, explored much of the uh, South American continent back in the uh, 17th, uh, 18th century, 19th century, early 19th century. And uh, another one of these seas that kind of rocks in and out of view, like uh, I was talking about Mari Oriental. Now, here we are, another view of it. We notice uh, Humboldt Island is considerably farther toward us now. This is a, uh, here's our same Endymion, but much closer to us. Same Mari Humboldt Island, but now along the rim, the limb of the moon, we see a bump. That bump is actually at almost 110 degrees longitude. Now the traditional limb of the moon is 90 degrees, but the elevation of the rim around uh, Compton Crater on the far side, coupled with the libration of the moon tipping it as far toward us as it can, here we're actually looking at a feature on the far side of the moon. Volcanism on the moon. Uh, to locate us, here is Kepler Crater on uh, Oceanus Procellarum. And uh, look at it again. There we go. Uh, we've got the Aristarchus Plateau up at the north. Um, it's a big brown crater at the corner of it. That's Aristarchus. We saw that earlier as one of the uh, three splashes of rays that uh, uh, highlights uh, northern Procellara. Uh, this whole area is built up by volcanic eruptions. Uh, a very large plateau up there that uh, is uh, built up above the normal flat plains of Oceanus Procellarum. Then down toward the south, the Marius Hills. It looks like a collection of dozens of little bumps. Each one of them is a small shield volcano. A ghost crater is a crater that formed on a maria or in a, in a basin prior to it being flooded with basalt to create a maria and it gets buried, but not to the extent that it's ex completely erased. You can still see evidence of it. Sometimes just the crown of the rim protrudes. It looks like a ring. Sometimes it creates wrinkle ridges in the, in the mari lava of basalt to uh, show the former um, location of this, this buried crater. We call them ghost craters. In this case, uh, uh, we're on uh, Mari Tranquilitatis. Uh, we're looking at the ghost crater Lamont, and uh, highlighted by the uh, ring of wrinkle ridges created by the rim of the crater as, as the basalt salt is uh, subsided <coughs> above it. And just for curiosity, the Apollo 11 landing site. I gotta hurry up, I'm about out of time. Um, Yep, well, got a button. Uh, floor fractured crater, we've mentioned that. Um, floor fractured craters are craters near or on the edge of Maria that the subsurface <laughs> volcanism has pushed the bottom of the crater floor upward and uh, modified it, raised it up, sometimes flooded it. And in this case, um, we're uh, looking at Petavius Crater over on the uh, eastern limb of the moon and uh, Rima Batavius. Looks kind of like the, the clock of a hand, uh, hand of a clock. Uh, Rima Batavius extending off in one direction and then above the other um, branch of Rima Batavius. Makes it look like a clock saying about 20 minutes to 12. Almost lunchtime. Uh, Posidonius is another very famous floor fractured crater. Started out looking very similar to Copernicus or Tycho, at a central peak, collapsed walls, you know, bowl-shaped crater. And then uh, 
before it got pushed up by volcanism, flooded with lava, the lava receded or subsided, cooled, shrank, cracked, created the series of uh, uh, rills in it, the uh, rhyme of Posidonis. And uh, people always wonder, what's this one? The horseshoe? So it's Le Monnier. And just for good measure, in 1973, that's where the uh, last unmanned lunar rover, the Russian Luna Hot 3, us, uh, Luna Hot 2, uh, landed within Le Monnier and roamed around for about four months. Uh, Serpentine Ridge, another one of those wrinkle ridges that I was referring to. Uh, the Eastern Mars Serenitatis. Crater rays, <clears throat> I've mentioned them several times. Uh, they're the debris that is splashed out. I'm losing it. The debris splashed out by the impact that created the, uh, the crater. Uh, bigger the crater, the bigger the rays, of course. But uh, on the other hand, the brighter the rays, the younger they are. So. Uh, We've got uh, two fairly bright ones down on the uh, southeastern corner of the moon, uh, Stavinius A and Phanerius A, uh, real close to each other, extremely bright at full moon, so they get the, uh, the nickname of, oops, I didn't even put that slide in there. Okay, they get the nickname of the headlights. Uh, another class of rays are called butterfly rays. Notice that they don't scatter in all directions. Uh, they're very directional. Now, the reason for this is a very low oblique impact. Um, asteroid strikes the moon at less than five degrees elevation. Uh, it doesn't blast material in all directions. Um, the spray either goes to the sides and downrange. So we end up with these butterfly patterns with very low oblique impacts. And this particular one is Proclus Crater. Uh, it is on the uh, little highland rim between Mare Crisium and uh, Mare Tranquilitatis. And I mentioned Proclus. Now, not all craters are round, as I've mentioned before. Here we've got this uh, very unusual looking crater rate at E, um, keyhole shape almost. Valleys on the moon. Uh, there's a number of them. The Raina Valley being the most popular because uh, it's 600 kilometers long. It's a fairly substantial feature. Um, but it's got this mysterious dog leg right in the middle by the mallet, crater mallet. Straight then whoosh, off to one direction. Leads me to believe that this is not all one feature. I believe it is created by two separate incidents. Um, the upper part and the bottom part are two separate features. So my thinking is leave the Ray of Valley be, but we should rename the bottom part of it the Mallet Valley after the uh, crater right next to it. Mountains on the moon, answering your question. Um, mountains on the moon are all the result of a massive impact, asteroid strike that created a basin on the moon. Basins on the moon have, are basically huge craters. They have a rim around them just like a regular crater does. In this case, we're looking at the rim of the Imbrium Basin, and this is another picture that I've turned on its side. It's actually supposed to be this way. So uh, this is the eastern part of Mare Imbrium. But to get the picture in uh, a reasonable uh, resolution, we've turned it sideways. So we've got the Alps Mountains up on the northern part. The rim continues around. We call it the Caucasus Mountains. Further down, we get the Apennine Mountains. And some of these peaks could reach five kilometers, the tallest on the moon. Um, arcing down further toward Copernicus Crater, we earlier saw the, Car the uh, Carpathian Mountains. So the rims of these massive impact basins are what create the mountains on the moon. They are not created by tectonic activity like on Earth. Uh, mountains on the moon uh, were created almost four billion years ago and have remained unchanged in that period of time. On Earth, 
mm, plate tectonics create new mountains or erase old mountains on a time scale of hundreds of millions of years. So uh, all the mountains on Earth are just infants compared to these. And these will still be standing exactly as they are now when the mountains we now know on the Earth are gone and replaced by new ones, of course. So, so they're formed by repeated Excuse me? Gates to the surface there, they're formed by repeated gates to the surface. Uh, no, the, like one, the, one massive, the one massive impact that created the whole Imbrian Basin which, basic, but yeah. other basic oh, for the other ones, problems. yeah, there, there's other ones, yeah like, yeah, like I was saying, the Pyrenees Mountains that are on the eastern part of, uh, of uh, um, escape, yeah. <laughs> uh, cliffs on the moon, scarps, uh, most popular one, uh, long one, about 600 kilometers long, is the Altai Scarp. It is the surviving, only surviving piece of the outer Nectaris Basin impact ring. The inner ring is covered up with basalt when the Nectaris, Mario Nectaris formed. The uh, central ring is just barely detectable as a series of, of, of ridges and bumps, but the outer ring down in the uh, southwest forms the Altai Scarp and it has not been demolished yet by, uh, by uh, ongoing in, uh, impacts. So uh, it's the best preserved uh, scarp on the moon, the uh, outer, outer impact ring on the Nectaris Basin. Now, people think the moon doesn't change much. It's pretty static, pretty much the same night by night. Phases get bigger and then come back and shrink and then come back again. But if you watch in a period of just two hours on the moon, near the Terminator, you can see some action. Picture on the left, picture on the right, only two hours difference. This is Ptolemaeus Crater, and you can see the shadows on the moon slowly receding over a period of hours, uh, finally exposing Ammonius Crater in the, in the middle of uh, Ptolemaeus. So the moon does change. The moon is ever-changing. The phases grow and shrink day by day. The shadows change hour by hour. The moon is a geologic wonder ground. There's all kinds of geology just right there in front of us at the telescope. Uh, thus, the moon is accessible from our own backyard. You don't need to travel out to dark sky. Uh, you don't need dark sky uh, uh, or a big telescope to see uh, the significant features on the moon. It is truly a backyard object that you can see any time. So I like to say there is much to love on the moon. I join you to uh, I invite you to come join me on my playground. So thank you for your attention. It's been